next speaker is uh, Yin Chui from, uh, also from University of Washington. Yeah, perfect. Um, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, NLP and uh, semantics. Okay, so um, why grounded language and knowledge? Um, I think it's partly because it's cool, but also because it's going to be an important step toward intelligent communication. So um, what do I mean by that? I'm going to characterize that as the ability to read between the lines, which seems to be um, the fundamental difference between how we understand language as a human and how machines tend to understand human language. So. Um, given a news headline like a cheeseburger stabbing, for example, what does this mean? Um, a someone stabbed a cheeseburger, or a cheeseburger stabbed someone, or a cheeseburger stabbed another cheeseburger, um, someone stabbed someone else with a cheeseburger, and so forth. And more plausible interpretation would be that someone stabbed someone else over a cheeseburger. So. <clears throat> Uh, reading between the lines requires understanding what's in a sentence as well as things that are not in the sentence. Um, and so here, the fact that there's probably someone and then someone else in the scene um, has not been mentioned, but we somehow um, can infer this just uh, based on the kind of background knowledge that we have about the world. And similarly, when we follow cooking recipe like this, um, we see a sentence like bake for half hour, and we don't even notice that um, bake what or bake where um, are not even mentioned, and uh, because we almost in instantaneously fill in this sort of missing information um, using the knowledge about the world. So speaking of knowledge, according to philosophers of knowledge, there are different types of knowledge. Propositional knowledge is knowledge of that, and um, so for example, who is the president of which country and in born in what year, et cetera. Um, but the other kinds of propositional knowledge are more like common sense type knowledge. So bananas are typically yellow, elephants are bigger than butterflies, and so forth. And yet another type of knowledge is procedural knowledge. So this is knowledge of how, for example, how to bake blueberry muffins or ride a bicycle. And Compared to um, encyclopedic knowledge, which has been studied a lot in NLP um, field uh, uh, under this information extraction effort, um, relatively less effort have been made for um, learning the other types of knowledge. So the big question here is then, um, can we somehow learn this sort of common sense type knowledge um, in, uh, in the form of some sort of a representation learning? And I expect that um, probably the reaction to this question can be fairly divisive depending on um, where you're coming from. Um, some of you may be a little bit um, skeptical about this, which is understandable considering what happened in 70s and 80s in AI. But I'm going to take the other perspective where, well, uh, life is short and there's only one way to find out. So I've been um, just poking around a little bit to find answers for what kind of knowledge may be learnable and not learnable, what kind of a representation makes sense, and what kind of uh, learning paradigm might make sense. So just briefly about end-to-end -end learning. So um, especially for NLP, some sort of like sequence-to-sequence -sequence style architecture, this has been um, incredibly useful for a variety of different tasks, and that's been really very exciting. And the general recurring theme is that machine learning representation tends to be better than human engineered features, although um, I still see that some people uh, integrate both of them anyhow. But um, so it's very exciting. Um, the caveat is that it tends to be successful when someone can bother to create very large amount of high quality data. Um, and also, what it means is that uh, we cannot really do this for uh, all kinds of tasks. So I worked on neural sonnet composition, and turns out the mankind overall didn't write enough number of sonnets uh, in the entire, entire human history. So um, it's not enough to feed the data-hungry neural networks um, uh, to frame it as end-to-end -end learning. So we did make use of language models based on neural network. However, it's not end-to-end. -end. So, but the bigger question for us at the moment is how does this sort of um, learning paradigm relate to the, kind, the different kinds of common sense knowledge? So uh, part of my research has been around the procedural language and knowledge. Uh, these are basically, I'm referring to natural language instructions. And my wishful thought is that one day, 
In my lifetime, I wake up in the morning, there's a robot in my house um, cooking something for me. And so natural, lang uh, natural language instructions are grounded by nature uh, in the sense uh, if you follow that instruction, you are ultimately interacting with the world and changing the state of the world. So um, examples include, of course, cooking recipes, but also biology wet lab instructions, and more broadly, all kinds of how to do X sort of instructions that are um, available in a very large quantity online today. So the unique challenges in studying procedural language is that, which is very different from Newswire articles that have been studied a lot more. Uh, first of all, if you don't know the state of the art parser, so they tend to think that um, imperative sentences are not very common. So grease with butter is noun with another butter, which sounds really greasy. And elided arguments are really common, as mentioned before. Something else that's interesting is that um, the identities of entities change over time in such a way that, um, for example, whisk eggs, add flour, fold the sugar into the wet mixture. So we cannot really apply um, traditional co-reference resolution system and expect that um, this refers to something exactly mentioned somewhere uh, before because it's now new entity that was created as a result of ex executing some of these previous sentences. So at the very beginning, we thought that um, we're going to create some uh, parsing style representation that we named as action graph. And uh, the gist of it goes to something like this. So when we have a sentence like, in a large bowl, stir together milk, egg, and oil, we want to understand that um, stir is the main action applied to different arguments, like here. And for any of these arguments, we want to know where they originally came from. So milk may have been, um, so these are all arguments of the verb. But um, for some of these arguments, we want to know where they came from. So they may have been um, ingredients available in your kitchen. but. Something interesting happens when we see the next sentence. So add flour to the wet mixture. In this case, flour and wet mixture are two different arguments. And so this one refers to the result of the previous action, stir. And so that's our representation. Like for every single argument, we want to know exactly where they came from. And something else um, to think about is oftentimes you see a sentence like just add flour without the second argument. And even in, in those cases, we want to know that in fact there's a second argument, which does refer to um, one of the previous, previous actions that has been um, executed. So the graph structure just uh, briefly looks something like this. And um, at a high level, this is similar to semantic role labeling in natural language research. Uh, key difference is that we do want to uh, think about labeling implicit arguments as well. And also, um, we touch on this notion of um, so we, this graph represents how different entities are flowing through a sequence of different actions, which touches on this question of reference resolution in a different way. And um, lastly, it's going to be document level understanding. So unlike sentence level parsing, which has been studied more often, um, here we want to be able to do this parsing at a document level. So, I'm not going to go too much um, uh, into detail of what kind of model we were doing. It's just a briefly unsupervised approach based on probabilistic model where we have a chicken and egg problem that in order to do the action graph of parsing well, we need to have some sort of a background knowledge. In order to acquire that knowledge, uh, we do need to have this parsing result. So not surprisingly, uh, we did expectation maximization on it. The reason why we didn't do fully supervised approach is because the annotation turns out to be really, really um, difficult. So we can't really do this in a large quantity. Um, anyway, so the probability model has some components in it that does encode uh, some notion of knowledge. For example, when you see oil and vinegar mentioned uh, in the previous sentences, uh, it's more likely that you're going to see dressing as opposed to better. And flour tends to be referenced to some initial ingredients, with, whereas better tends to refer to some sort of intermediate entity. And when you see actions like um, bake, the location is likely to be rather oven than stove. So this sort of knowledge has been just um, uh, 
recovered from unstructured text. We didn't give this as prior knowledge. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to ask about the middle one. So the first, uh, the first and the third I see it's kind of like word or something. But how do you infer the <coughs> middle one? So yeah, I, I um, sort of skipped the details, but um, these are part of the large joint probability model that we write. And some of these are sort of like um, machine translation type, like IBM model one, where we learn the translation of uh, words uh, when, when they appear in one sentence and then when they may be getting mentioned in some other sentence. Um, so that's roughly what it looks like. Uh, but the IBM approach is, does it, does it scale? I mean, because these things may be like far apart, 20 words, 30 words apart. Right. So, um, we, okay, it, then I have to say something a little bit more. So um, the model has two components. So one part is about um, this sort of like word to word mapping. The other part has something to do with graph connectivity because we somehow need to infer this graph connectivity as well. And so uh, when we do EM in uh, one part, we do uh, this graph structure induction. Once we have that, we fix it, like, um, so this is hard EM, and then we try to infer the probability score, assuming that the graph structure is correct, and so we repeat until convergence. Uh, I lost your time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, um, this part I uh, meant to go very briefly, mainly because it sort of sets up the um, intuition toward other work that I was going to talk more um, later. So. This one is, this table shows some example knowledge that's um, automatically recovered. So for example, when eggs appear first, they tend to, so um, we tend to see other wording like egg, yolk, mixture, noodles, whites later. And the model learns that um, the eggs are likely to be part of uh, this sort of composite nouns that appear later. So, and by the way, I didn't cherry pick. These are just um, the order of words in their decreasing probability score. Um, and then there are other types of knowledge learned. But in general, um, the reason why we were doing this in the first place was because we wanted to be able to translate unstructured text into more structured information from which um, abstract away some details and learn the prototypical uh, structure of um, uh, how to knowledge, and from which perhaps we could do planning and then be able to generate a uh, new recipe. So imagine that the robot in your kitchen, uh, just look at what kind of uh, ingredients are available that day and just come up with some nice recipe. So that's what we thought originally that we might do, but after struggling for a while, uh, we decided that it's not going to go anywhere because action graphs um, automatically learn tend to be very noisy and also it's not trivial to think about how to abstract things away. So this leads to the next um, approach that was based on um, neural network base, um, basically. So the task definition is that the input is going to be a title and the list of ingredients in your kitchen, which later we're going to also generalize for other types of um, generation tasks like dialogue response generation. And the output is going to be just long text with many sentences. And the goal is uh, to create a dish that um, satisfies this original goal given as a title, and then try to make use of and only those ingredients that are given to us. And so initially we thought that, well, encoder decoder seems super promising, so why don't we try that and see what happens? So this is what happens. Uh, the title is Sausage Sandwiches. And RNN starts generating lots of sandwiches. Eventually, it recovers from sandwich overdose, but still, um, it repeats things at least twice. So it doesn't really have a very good uh, control over the entire structure. Global coherence tends to be missing. And uh, one important difference between the cases when um, this sort of encoder-decoder architecture works, and the case like us, uh, in, in this case, when it doesn't work, importantly, the alignment ratio is only minority case. So of those words in the output, only 6 to 10% of them align back to something in the input, which means that like 90 to 94% of the times, it's really a good idea not to pay attention to the input at all. So, and 
somehow a lot of words in the output has to be generated out of nowhere. Um, so in order to handle that challenge, we, um, we came up with this um, neural checklist model. Uh, very, but just to give you the high level insights of how this works. So the title is garlic tomato salsa, and then maybe there are four different ingredients as shown here. And we are going to build upon regular RNN. What I mean by that is really GRUs in this case. So um, first to somehow encode the title, and then there's going to be this a checklist of ingredients that we are going to be also encoding as some sort of a vector representation. And given that, we are going to be projecting uh, one word at a time. And just before that, we are going to have this hidden state um, switcher or classifier that contextually determines whether I am about to generate a word that's um, non-ingredient or uh, mention of new ingredients or co-reference to something that I have already produced in the past. So it goes something like this. First, um, let's say we already generated the chop the. So at this point, um, neural network is going to contextually decide that hmm, I'm going to generate a new ingredient, in which case it's going to attend to the list of things that we haven't used yet and softmax over it and perhaps choose tomatoes and check that off from the list um, and then move forward. So in this work, uh, there's no sentence boundaries per se, but it's just that uh, neural network learns to put where, uh, period from time to time so that it's, um, uh, it makes better sense for us to read. So the second sentence may be dice the, and at this point, again, neural network may decide contextually that I'm going to use yet another unused ingredients. So of these three that have not been used, it uh, projects and uh, maybe onion came out as the most promising choice. Check this off and then move forward. So now something interesting happens when we want to say add to blah. So in this case, it's uh, contextually, you usually um, add to something that you have already created. So um, of those two ingredients that we have already used, we're going to now um, soft max over it and perhaps we chose uh, tomatoes and so that's how it works. So this is high level idea, but of course, everything has to be differentiable end to end and so forth. So the checklist is not really black and white checklist. Um, it's more like probabilistic checklist. So everything is uh, probabilistic and in addition to that, this switcher is also not really discrete. It's more of interpolation between three different cases. And so that's how it works. And of these three cases, only one of them is a generic language model. The other two cases are based on attention mechanisms. So um, one attention, so it's like a paired mechanism. So one attention is going to be over available ingredients in a probabilistic sense. And then the other one is going to be about attention over used ingredients. And so attention vector gets accumulated over time. So we know probabilistically which ingredients we have used more. Uh, so, question. yeah. This is a generative model. So this is attention in a generative model. Yeah. And how is that attention moving then? So, oh, I see it's some probabilistic process. Yeah, so everything is probabilistic in the sense the checklist is basically just accumulation of attention over time. And then whenever we want to focus on uh, the use the portion, we just do one minus those values so that it's attending on the, the other part, the, the other set of ingredients in a probabilistic sense. Yeah. So everything is in the end just uh, matrix operation, vector op operations, plus minus multiplications. So once we have, um, so the attention part is that um, we have this ingredient list for which we have original word embedding, and then compared to the hidden state of GRU, and um, we do just the usual business of computing this uh, attention coefficients, and then um, use that coefficient in order to compose the representation of the new um, ingredient, which can sometimes be combination of like tomatoes and carrots, in which case, ideally, when we generate a word out of it, we don't want to say tomato or carrot, but we should say vegetables. So that's uh, the high level idea of the model. And so I'm going to just um, gloss over some of this automatic evaluation that's in the paper, but let's look at um, example pairs to see um, how you can tell apart which is which. So one is a human, the other one is a machine. 
The title is uh, Oven Eggplant. And the first one goes like this. In a small bowl, combine the cheese, eggplant, basil, oregano, tomato sauce, and onion. Mix well, shape mixture into six patties, each about 3 quarters inch thick. Place on baking sheet. Bake at 350 degrees for 30 minutes or until lightly browned. Southern Living Magazine sometime in 1980. Typed for you by Nancy Corman. The second recipe is like cook eggplant in boiling water, cover it for 10 minutes, drain and cut in half lengthwise, scoop out inside leaving half inch shell, mash inside with cottage cheese, onion, bay leaf, basil, oregano, and tomato sauce, preheat oven to 350, stuff eggplant halves, place in casserole dish and bake covered for 15 minutes. <laughs> so let's take a vote. Um, how many, like, uh, who thinks this, the first one is written by machine? One is, is it like lack of opinion, or you really think that the second one is by motion? Who thinks second one is by motion? Really? Um, no, the first one is by motion. Um, so why did you think the second one is by motion? I for you by Nancy. No, but also just the style. Style. Uh, like the. Like sometimes doesn't capitalize. I, I see that. Yeah. That's your point. I guess. That's yeah. Point. Yeah. So the, the make those errors. yeah. The because of this argumax sampling nature of um, the way we generate, it tends to really focus on safe language. The RNN language tends to be, at least in this particular application, RNN was surprisingly good at generating grammatically correct sentence. I think it's because w sentences in this domain tends to be pretty simple. There's no uh, really difficult long dependency. Um, which is more common with newswire text. Um, so that's partly why uh, this was in the data set, which is why RNNs sometimes learn to put that in. Uh, yeah, all comes from data. And this one is more complex in a way. So the procedure that's more complex tends to not work well with um, LSTMs just yet. Question, where's yep. that example from? This doesn't seem like a published source. Oh, so this is from uh, now you're cooking data set that we uh, collected and then um, used. And the network was trained on about 84,000 recipes. And uh, I mean, I, I admit that I chose one that's kind of tricky and uh, chose a recipe generated by machine that looks better. But I can show you worse examples. You could offer a taste test. That yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, people keep asking if I cooked any of this. The answer is no. I, that's why I, I wish the robot does it for me. Uh, so skillet chicken rice, um, in this case, uh, it's relatively easy case in the sense this recipe exists a lot in a variety of different forms. Baseline is RNN, so it starts OK. Like in a large skillet, brown chicken in oil, add chicken and rice, cook. But it starts repeating, unsurprisingly, add rice and broth, stir in more rice, keep cooking, um, uh, add in more rice. And I wonder what be it becomes in the end if you cook it this way. So checklist, on the other hand, is able to um, have much cleaner global coherence. So um, it doesn't repeat as much, which is a, a little bit surprising in a way, because we are not really uh, modeling the local or global coherence in a very precise way. We are just sketching out the architecture so that it does have some access to the global um, outline of the generation. And somehow, that seems to really help for it to generate um, text that's much better. So, but this one is an easier example. And by, by the way, this is a human recipe that's um, generally more complex. And um, there's just more detail. So this is harder example. Chocolate covered potato chips. I don't know how many of you had this in your life before. Baseline doesn't know what to do with it because it just hasn't seen this example before. So probably it's a good idea to preheat the oven. But start um, baking an empty pan. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas checklist does something a little bit more sensible, although now it starts making some mistakes too because it's dealing with a context that's not as familiar. So it uh, also does weird thing at the beginning. I mean, it does some baking suddenly. And then uh, think, uh, start melting chocolate. Probably it's a good idea. Um, there's a bit of this grammar errors here. Eventually, it does fry in hot oil. 
which makes sense, and then serve hot, except that um, I wonder what happens if you try to fry something that's already covered in chocolate. Uh, human recipe, in this case, it's very, very detailed. So this is a hard example. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the limitations of a uh, checklist model. But just briefly, we also applied the same system for dialogue system generation um, with, based on the data set from EMNLP best paper. Um, when at all 2015. And there, even though our model was not really developed for that task, we did um, better. Anyway, so the part that I wanted to highlight a little bit is the, so it seems that we can go pretty far with simple sequence to sequence models, but something critical is missing still. So given an example like deep fried cauliflower, so this is also a little bit hard example because people don't deep fry cauliflower very often. So this is what checklist does. Wash and dry the cauliflower, probably a good idea. And then um, heat the oil in a skillet, fry the sauce until they are golden brown. Probably reasonable, but um, what's wrong? The cauliflower is still fresh. It has not been fried ever. So um, in order to know this sort of mistakes, it seems that um, just surface string-based models probably are not going to go very far. And it seems that we need to have much better reasoning capability or knowledge integrated into the model. So that goes to the next component, which is in preparation. We, don't, we didn't really nail down our name yet. So I don't know what it's going to be called yet. but. It's a sort of um, similar to Chris Dyer reference aware language model and also Jan uh recurrent entity networks in the sense that we want to have entity representations that are recurrent. Um, actually, let me just do it this way. So first, the idea is that um, it's going to be parsing by simulation or analysis by synthesis. Um, may or may not make sense uh, the, right away. but. Um, so the assumption is that we, the way human understand language is that we already know what kind of things we can actually act on in the real world. So we have already some knowledge about some actions that we can perform. And we also have some good understanding about the causality of these actions. So in this particular case, we think about the location change, composition change, um, whether you wash something or not, whether you cook something or not, whether the temperature changes and so forth. Um, and then um, ideally, we want to have embodied robot that goes out and learn this sort of action causality knowledge from interacting with the world. But since, I don't know, uh, such a robot is not available to me yet, um, I thought that we could just ask Turkers about this sort of knowledge and then start from there. So let's say we already learned some um, predefined set of actions. And first, we read in some uh, language sentences, instructions uh, using GRU. And then what happens next is that um, we have this sort of like a fixed set of actions that uh, re are represented as maybe a vector or matrices, and also uh, ingredient list as a list of um, uh, vectors. And we are going to attend over this. So we attend over actions, we attend over entities, and we compose, um, so we have now, um, uh, alignment coefficient, uh, sorry, attention coefficients. And then once we have that, we can compose new action representation as well as new, um, uh, new uh, entity representation such that we learn to uh, predict what happened to different entities. So, so that's a sort of a high level idea, but um, it's a work in preparation. So. Uh, that's the part about procedural language. Now I'm going to uh, touch briefly on other types of knowledge that I've been also um, toying with. So uh, this is going to be by and large about um, knowledge about objects, actions, and events. And so last year, I had this um, view that maybe in order to um, cope with this reporting biases, so people don't say that elephants are bigger than butterflies. Um, or um, whether uh, when horse is eating, whether the horse is standing or sitting, it seems like 
we don't have much hope to learn these sort of things from language, so perhaps we should look at images. And what makes a wedding a wedding? Like, um, usually people uh, exchange vows and then uh, uh, dancing happens later. So we wanted to learn this sort of knowledge by combining um, images with language. And by and large, it tends to work for learning a small set of knowledge, but this year, I thought that um, I'm going to try something different because um, image processing tends to be very, very expensive still, and um, the amount of knowledge that I learn out of it seems somewhat um, um, in a smaller scale. So this year, uh, I'm going back to just language only version, and so that's going to be uh, something like this. So people don't say things like, I am larger than a chair. Um, or then larger than a pen or a stone or a bowl or a towel. So how do we learn this sort of knowledge without looking at images at all? So here's an idea. Although people don't say those things, the way people talk about the world implies a lot about this sort of object-object knowledge. So you, I can throw the pen or stone or chair or bowl and towel, which tends to mean uh, a variety of different physical relative knowledge that x probably is bigger than y, x weighs more than y, and therefore probably af after this action, y moves faster than x. So um, it covers some of these preconditions and postconditions of actions. And we can represent this as some sort of a frame knowledge such that for um, any pair of rows involved in an action, we can think about different physical implications um, coming from that verb. So uh, if you walk into the house, uh, probably you're smaller than the house, lighter than the house, and so forth. And also, if you squash uh, the bug with, uh, uh, if I do that with my boot, then a um, uh, number of different things are true. So uh, with that in mind, um, what we do is basically reverse engineering some of these, some aspects of common sense knowledge by solving two related puzzles simultaneously. So we want to learn verb physics frame knowledge as well as inferring object-object relations. Um, in this work, we tried um, size, weight, strength, flexibility, and speed. And um, we do that without embodiment. And importantly, some of this physical knowledge is not even visual. So weight tends to be not visual, or we think it's a visual, but um, with com current computer vision, um, it's not really visual. So strength and flexibility and even speed, yeah, we can look at videos, but it's hard to process a lot of videos. So the idea is that by creating this sort of like inference network as a factor graph, we can solve this puzzle. So very briefly, it looks promising. Um, and so I'm going to now uh, wrap up uh, what we learned so far about representation learning of common sense knowledge. So I've been going a little bit back and forth between the representation choice. So at the beginning, uh, action graph was more symbolic. And then um, for the purpose of generating and composing new recipes, it seems that such a symbolic representation is not necessary. Um, when the um, target task is close to knowledge, and um, it, uh, then it seems that we can get away just with um, implicit representation in the network. Um, and so uh, on a related note, end-to-end -end learning uh, seems applicable in some cases, like um, the neural checklist model case when the procedure knowledge tends to align pretty well with what's in the surface string. And in those cases, we can do that. But in the second part of the talk, where we wanted to learn uh, knowledge that's not really mentioned explicitly in text, um, especially propositional knowledge about objects and actions, it seems that setting up end-to-end -end learning framework doesn't make as much sense. And in fact, we probably want to solve these sort of questions more directly. So that's what we did. And reverse engineering certain types of common sense knowledge seems feasible, and perhaps we can think more about that. And lastly, um, there are these questions about like how do we organize knowledge that um, 
we learn. And one hypothetical thought toward this is that perhaps a lot of this knowledge is really tied to lexical knowledge or frame knowledge. So that's one option we could organize. And in fact, I uh, was glossing over the modeling detail, but some part of the model, although it's based on factor graph, the um, unary factors are based on uh, embeddings learned from Skipgram style model. So there's uh, some um, opportunities for better integrating symbolic and uh, neural representations. So that concludes my talk. Questions? We have time. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested with the generative models of the recipe. So you said you didn't, you didn't actually generate one of those symbolic graphs when you were producing the, right. the generated recipes, right. right? Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I was kind of interested in that because it, it feels like, I mean, some of those um, inconsistencies, Yeah. it feels like a recipe is a rather different kind of thing to be generating than, like, a piece of art or a piece of music or something. It, it's somehow like a recipe somehow is either, like, valid or not when, when you're actually doing it. So right. I, I, guess, I guess, I mean... Does that mean that there might be some promise in actually trying to generate a graph and then afterwards yes, <laughs> yes. generating the language so, after that? So that's an excellent question. In fact, Chloe Kidon, who was the leading author for um, the first two pieces of work, um, in her thesis, she did do that. So she was generating text together with the graph. It's just that it was really time for her to um, graduate. So we didn't write a paper or, um, uh, yeah, we, we we didn't follow up on that, but so we did do that, and what we got is that if we tr so in that case we are training the mo the neural network to learn from automatically parsed action graphs, so that's going to be noisy. Um, but give, although it's noisy, it seems like it's learning some of these prominent patterns in a meaningful way. Um, when we generate text together with the graph, it tends to over specify things somehow. But um, th these things may, uh, one may be able to address these things with more investigation, but that's sort of where we wrapped things up at that point. And then currently, we're trying to see whether we can um, validate whether something makes sense or not without um, explicit graph representation. So that's uh, the third piece that I was mentioning briefly, where you have this network architecture that could simulate what's happening to the entities in the world. And the way you prove whether you understood something or not is to be able to uh, predict correctly what happened to each of these entities in the end. So that's potentially one version of it. I think there may be other ways of thinking about this. In fact, I began also thinking about story understanding. Like, you know, you do things to each other and change each, other, each other's feelings. And it's almost like this sort of um, representation where things happen to entities, and then you want to learn what happened to them. And that's how you um, prove that you understood text beyond being able to label which is noun, which is verb, and, and so forth. Yeah. Yes? How often, also on the generation thing, how yeah. often do you think it is that the model is just regurgitating whole sentences or longer things uh, copied directly from the training set? Yeah, so copy doesn't happen very often when um, the generation surf, uh, uh, space is somewhat constrained by some means, even in a soft way. So the checklist that has this attention over ingredients tends to prevent um, RNNs from behaving, just copying everything and then repeat. But RNNs tend to do that, especially when it's more familiar with the context. When context is not familiar, it tends to start generating very strange sequence of things. So uh, uh, I'm reminded of the poetry we're showing, the sonnet. Yeah. So is yes. that, oh, there you have. So, all right, so is that like some kind of a similar graph over emotions? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, now that you ask me that, I uh, didn't see that coming. But yeah, I happen to have this slide. So I mentioned earlier that end-to-end, seek-to-seek model doesn't work with the sonnet generation. Fortunately, Kevin Knight at ISI already had finite state automata constructed over um, 15K vocabulary back then. And so if you sample out of this finite state automata, you get legal sonnet. It's just that it's completely random, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So we intersected that with um, LSTMs. And um, there are a number of engineering details. For example, 
uh, it's really hard to generate out of LSTM that happens to follow the rhyming rules. So we generate things backward, and then there are some other additional details. The language model was trained on song lyrics. So that, uh, a lot of things are out there, as well as Wikipedia. Um, and so this is um, one example sonnet that was composed by the machine. So the input is just Turing, that's the title. And it goes like this, creating some electric slot machine of hearing those familiar voices say, awake behind an empty picture mean, the windows open over Alan K. Consider me a regular expression or maybe something very quickly typed. And I forget about an old obsession, a hundred thousand people getting hyped. It knows something. <laughs> Become the biggest part of my computer and take another journey down the road or set a balance on a minor scooter or even matter whose enigma code and music text control of all the means is surrounded by a world of strange machines. So, yeah. okay. uh, But I mean, for me, the really um, uh, insight, so the takeaway message, at least for me, was that although end-to-end -end may not be always possible, there's something about this sort of like base components like a language model when it's combined with um, like uh, constraints, constrained optimization. Like in this case, it's discrete decoding. But it seems that we can do a lot of things. And it may, uh, like current hypothesis for me is that um, some of these things that work really well with encoder decoder may work even better if we had very, very strong language model combined with some other interesting inference algorithms. Yes? <coughs> Just to guess, is the basic idea of this intersection to kind of use the R and M to um, score all of the possible things from the state machine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I guess I was going to ask: Did you try prior of experts kinds of models? Or, uh, like, no. So expert, which uh, yeah, take your rhyming and all. Yeah. Right. Um, there may be something interesting to consider. Uh, yeah. We no, we haven't done that. In fact. Actually, uh, for me, the biggest challenge right now is that it's a sort of on topic, but global coherence is not there. And that seems like a really big challenge. And one hypothetical thought is that maybe we can do something like deep style transfer that Shamo is showing toward the end of his talk, where um, you have a coherent story, combine that with some different style of language, like sonnet language. Um, in fact, we have that work going on. But um, the coherence, it's really hard to keep, even with that. OK, we should, we should probably get